Welcome, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Lee Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown uh, Manhattan, where we are uh, having a few uh, nice fall days, almost summer days. High summer days might even be in Germany, where our guest today is from Froyan Malsacker. And, um, and uh, again, uh, we are in the middle middle of things, corona numbers around the world are shooting up and this uh, situation in, in the America also we all feel is heating up. Nobody really knows what will, what will happen. It's times of uncertainty at times where there seems to be uh, possibilities of violence, uh, notes and uh, suggestion that senators might be kidnapped, that parliaments would be stormed by militias, something unheard of could not even have been thought, we think, uh, before, but uh, we, we will see where this all uh, will be going. Uh, there's an election soon, and I think the smoke signs point towards change, and uh, there's just so much chaos. Also, America um, can take, and um, we hope uh, this will be on the right side of history, on the right side of the fight for freedom and liberties and uh, free speech, and this is what artists always have been. They have been on this side, they anticipated uh, uh, what is happening in the future and also found ways to make us comfortable with this, to um, uh, think, to help us imagine the present and the future in a way um, that um, is liberating and also close to the truth. And the truth um, is concept and Florian Malsacher and one of his uh, festivals of truth is concrete after all. So with us really is a, an important thinker, I feel, uh, of contemporary theater. Um, uh, Florian uh, is an independent performing arts curator and I'm read a bit from his uh, bio, a dramaturg and I would also stress that word that is of significance, a dramaturg and curator and a writer. And this can all uh, be combined. He was the artistic director of the Impulse Theater Festival in Germany, a co-programmer of the significant Steirische Herbst in Austria. And he curated numerous events, the 170 hour marathon camp, Truth is Concrete, on artistic strategies in politics, very early 2012. Also, I think in Moscow, he did uh, one on, on, on artistic uh, expression and freedom and speech. Uh, he also co-edited books on really significant great companies we look up to, Forced Entertainment, Remini Protocol, and this just came out. Let's, I think, when we last saw each other for the Nature Theater of Oklahoma, the great New York company and ensemble um, that also, you know, should be much, much more in the center of, of, of talks than it is in the Americas, at least here. His publications are looking for a political theater of today, empty stages, crowded flats, performativity as curatorial strategy, and the new one, which we're going to talk about now, it just came out. I think it was presented a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Gesellschaftsspiele, the games, uh, the games, the idea of games and society. To put this uh, in, into a perspective, uh, what is political theater today? So, uh, Florian, really thank you for taking the time. Where, where are you? What time is it? Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's six o'clock in the evening in Berlin now. So it's getting dark and it was not... We didn't have a nice fall day. It was raining all day, so. <laughs> yeah, and it gets dark early, right? It gets late early, uh, as uh, someone said about baseball, Yogi Berra, in the, some innings. Um, so how is it in Berlin, before we come to your book, what's going on in theater performance? Well, I mean, the theater reopened more or less just recently, and now it's a bit uncertain what will happen in the next weeks. So, so and of course, we have, you know, if, if you go to a theater, it's very limited numbers, seats have to be free. If, it has, if there's not a classical setup, if you move around, it's, it's really uh, very complicated. I just was in Vienna last week, and they, they had a performance where, which I didn't join, but they told me, like, the, in the whole performance, only 10 people could take part. So, so at a certain moment, so theaters, I think a lot of uh, the smaller, I'm more interested in the smaller theaters, of the smaller production houses and theaters, uh, that they really try to, to keep going in a way, sometimes almost in a symbolic in a symbolic level, like just to, to stay open and, and to, to see what is possible or not and how long it will be possible, we'll see. And now it's like everywhere also 
Germany, inside Germany, it's very different, but in Switzerland and, and Austria, then even, you know, what, what are the rules? Do you have to wear a mask inside or not? Do you, how much distance do you have to have and so on? But I must be, uh, to be honest, I, I've only been into a theater space twice since March. So, and I'm planning to go tomorrow. So I, I don't have too much inside of it. So what that's what see? I hear. What did you so, see? What did you see? I, uh, I went uh, to see at Wiener uh, Festwochen, uh, the festival in Vienna, that uh, they did a small program in this short moment where they could do something uh, recently. And I saw uh, new, uh, new works by Boris Nikitin, um, a, a Swiss uh, theater director who really does very, very interesting work. And um, so, I'm, uh, so I went there to see his show and to talk to him. Mm -hmm. This was, was one of the few. So, so it was possible to travel to, to Vienna and to Zurich, which is now already not really possible anymore, or at least strongly advised not to do. So it was a short moment. We had a month or uh, two months maybe where some things were possible and now we will see. Mm -hmm. So your book, it came out uh, yet now in 2020. I mean, you talk about theater up to 2019. It's one of the most recent books I have seen that really talks about theater of the present, of the moment. And in it, you... Before Corona, I think everything was done, but you made clear the sand is shifting. Um, the, the time is out of joint. New rules and new games in a way, or new ideas are needed. So tell us a bit, what was the idea to write this book? You did one before also for the Alexander Polak, who's the publisher of it, um, about uh, theater and the political. Um, what made you write the book? Well, I think on one hand it was a kind of a personal, a personal thing that I mean I edited several books also on the topic of politics and art and politics and theater and activism and so on, uh, but to actually sit down and write, write through it myself, not just collecting and writing a little bit around it, but like to really like, I mean maybe kind of not not really sum up, but to to see where we are after I don't know almost ten years of uh, I think a big change in terms of relations also of arts and politics and theater and politics. And um, also I had a feeling that, um, yeah, I mean, there are certain things that are, uh, that are kind of discussed, but not on a broader level. So I also wanted to write a book, which is not, not too academic. I'm not an academic, I'm a curator after all and a dramaturg uh, to also enable a bigger conversation in this case in German, in Germany, because it's written in German, uh, also with, a, with an interest in audience, interested audience in what, what can be political about theater today. Mm -hmm. And there's still, I had the feeling there's still prevailing a lot of ideas that are for me, not only a bit too old fashioned or conservative, but also actually not not really interesting for theater. I think that theater as a medium has certain possibilities to to well to try out society in certain ways uh, that 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 other mediums don't have, and that often there's not enough focus on this. And you have other things like yeah, storytelling and narrations and political analysis and whatever, which is maybe nice to have, but but that's not so unique to theater. So I also wanted to have a look at, at what I believe that is really in the core of, of the possibilities of theater. Yeah, I think you call many artists as your witnesses, talk a lot about this, but it also is not just written out of the stomach, out of the emotional moment of uh, review, but Julie, I think you have almost like a theory <clears throat> put together that after a post-traumatic uh, um, moment of in theater where this was the clearly handbook, there is something forming, I think also in, in, in nationally, globally, and I think your, your work is part of it. Tell us a little bit, what you say older ideas on theater and politics no longer work. What is working? What do you think? What, what should we pay attention to? Well, one thing is, I think, actually very simple and everybody knows it, but uh, still it's complicated to do, I guess, uh, is that I believe that the, the political in theater cannot only be in the content. I think it needs to be in the content, but it also needs to be in the form. And I think historically, you can say, I mean, ignoring a lot of exceptions, of course, you can say there was a strong focus, for example, on the content on the political content in the, let's say, director's theaters of the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was very much about uh, present, representing miseries uh, in the world and, and political situations and so on. But the form of it uh, was, was very conventional. It was rep representative theater in a way. I mean, a lot of the details, aesthetics were I mean, there were great directors, but but the, the, in, in terms of political understanding, it was a representational 
setup in a way. And then you could say like uh, post-dramatic forms and conceptual dance from the 90s and in the zeros um, were, were then in kind of in reaction to that, putting a big focus on form. So the post-dramatic theater is very much searched for theater, for the political in the form. And, and which which was was great and I think an important step but uh, but now I think it's important to see that actually the, the most interesting political moments in theater can happen if you if you consider both aspects of it so also in this form I mean what is the relationship to the audience so uh, how do you how, what is the you know there's the famous Brecht sentence that uh, when he writes about Stanislavski and others that he says but the the situation on stage, is shown as not changeable by the people in the audience. So, and, and the audience, of course, representing the people and the stage then uh, representing this, the order of society. And, and this is, I think, still not often not taken into account. If you want to, to, uh, to be political also in your artistic work, you, of course, need to also think what is the relation you create in reality while you talk about it. Um, and this is maybe uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the the aspects that I wanted to stress, and this under the again in, in a very specific medium, which which I think well, theater has this strange cap capability, or you can say paradox, that it really creates situations that are true and fictional at the same moment, that you can be inside and observe from the outside of the same moment. This is very unique to theater. You have it even in. Well, in the most classic theater, somebody says, I'm Hamlet, and you know, okay, I, I'm willing to believe you, but at the same time, I know you are actor X Epsilon and, uh, and you represent this role. And, and this shifting plays a role in theater. This has, I think, a strong political possibility also to, to really not only look at things that are represented, be part of it, understand that they're real also in the moment they are performed, but at the same time, being able to step out and, and look at it and analyze it or see the utopian or fictional potential of it. So, so this is a bit abstract now, but I think these are the two, <clears throat> uh, uh, two moments that I really think are very unique to theater and often not, let's say, not, not used enough uh, in, in, the, in the works we, we see on stage. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, comes out very clear in, in your, your work, uh, you say, how you do it is of importance, not just what you do. Normally you would say, well, it's a play about, you know, uh, children at war in Africa, or it's about capitalist uh, exploration uh, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the early industrialization in England, uh, or um, a mistreatment of minorities when you have shame and guilt, fear, anger as, a, as a reactions from the audience. But uh, if you look at it, how it is produced, it is one genius director who's in the hierarchy there, and actors are hired and fired. Um, theaters, especially in the US, often are privately owned. They are made to make money. They are part of a system. They actually represent the system. They, we show you the very best, and that's why you have to pay prices of 150, 200, sometimes $300 because they are the best actors. And if you, as the worker, and Claire Bishop also wrote about this, you know, that that model of the artist who has to struggle and is not paid and has no insurance is even used in this neo-capitalistic society for everybody who is struggling as a food delivery on a bicycle, say, this is what artists do. Maybe one day you will win also an Oscar because they made it. And this big lie, as Hannah Arendt said, the Fata Morgana of, 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 of that um, American dream that is no longer uh, there. And I think to say how you do it, and what does it represent as a system is something very, very, very significant. And I think you really put um, your finger um, on that. I mean, René Polesh, uh, the Berlin director and writer says he distributes the text and people, actors choose it with him. He said, if I write the main role and secondary role, I just represent everything. What I'm against, you also quote him other things. So, um, so, um, what do you feel? What are um, 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 examples of theater where you say, since after all, it is concrete, and as you said, theater is real for that moment, but it's also utopian, or it's uh, imaginary, but it is real for that moment. What are artists where you feel this represents really clearly this kind of new way of, of presenting work? 
Well, first of all, I would say there's not one way. So actually, I think the, 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 there's quite a huge variety of artistic practices that I try to show. So I think there's not one answer to it. There are, there are um, works that go further into the idea really of creating assemblies, of really try creating political moments in terms of also negotiating the, the role of the audience and how we, we, we imagine society together. So there are artists like the uh, Dutch actually visual artist Jonas Stahl, uh, who, who with his New World Summits kind of creates alternative parliaments in which uh, uh, people are speaking that are usually excluded from democratic discourse in a very uh, radical way. So they're, they're, they're usually people are speaking that are considered to be terrorists in, in some states and of course in others not, in others they are freedom fighters. So there's also this uh, uh, discrepancy. But basically you could say, yes, it's in, in a way it's a real parliament. It feels like a real parliament, but of course it doesn't have any power. But the people in there that are speaking are not actors. It's really representatives of different organizations. And uh, you as an audience have, have to negotiate all the time, like how, how do you feel about this? How, how, how do you relate to it and there's not one consensus presented it's often opinions that are quite contradictory uh, to each other um milo rao also created some of these parliaments so there's a whole strand of of of, of people and artists uh, that that work with the idea of assemblies which i find a really uh, very potent uh, potent and very Im important uh, uh, aspect of what political theater can be today but of course it's one it's one direction on the other hand, you can say there are also artists that maybe in a way use the stage in a more conventional way. They still use the stage and an audience that watches it, um, uh, but but shifts something which maybe shifts the whole imaginary. Um, there's a work which probably sounds a little bit uh, remote or, or strange, even from a, from a, a US American perspective, which has a completely different discourse around it. But uh, in, in Munich, a, a young, Black uh, theater maker uh, Antelina Recke um, took an existing play um, with a white ensemble, basically a white German ensemble, uh, and replaced. And it took exactly the same play and replaced the actors with black actors. So, so every, nothing was changed. All the timing, all the set, everything was done. It was on exactly happening on exactly the same stage, just with black actors, which for for German context was really it created a huge discussion in the feuilletons and, and quite uh, quite strange discussions partly also. Uh, so she, it's, it was a very conceptual idea, maybe a work of appropriation art, you could say, uh, to a degree. Um, uh, but it but it, it produced really, um, yeah, a, 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 a quite, quite an important yeah. uh, discussion in Germany that was not existing in this way uh, so far. So th this is a completely yeah. different way. So yeah, black copy, right? And they didn't, of course, have any black actors. And as you write in the book, yeah. the white body seems to be neutral, uh, carte blanche. You can interview a black body on stage all of a sudden is loaded. You know, even so, if I understand right, every movement, every gesture, every detail of the set design of lighting was copied from yeah. something was done by white artists for the white audience with them in mind actually written for them because they don't know anything else it's kind of a and brilliant idea actually a conceptual idea yeah it it, it 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 is and it's on so many levels because of course it also raised the question of who is in the ensemble in in, in this theater so so uh, it, it actually the the Münchner Kammerspiele uh, uh, the, under the directorship of Matthias Lienthal were quite diverse ensemble yeah. compared to others so so but still there there was not a single Black actors, so it was all guests. Everything performing there had to be a guest because there was no no one in the ensemble who could be part of it. So it was also work of institutional critique, you could say. Um, but it of course tested also how we uh, how we imagine. I mean, as Germans in this case, in front of a I guess a very German audience, how we imagine German society, and all the actors were um, were. German-born actors also on stage, so it's 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 uh, and it represented a completely different image. I mean, it's it's a very simple idea, but it was very powerful, especially in I think in a German-speaking context where certain certain discussions are maybe less advanced, but also a bit less heated than than in the U.S., for example. Yeah, I mean, it goes to that question also of identity uh, politics. You quote Achille uh, Mbebe, who said uh, the real question is not what unites us, you know, what normally was also part of a political movement, whether it was feminism, or ecological movement. The real question is 
how can we connect to what is not us, you know, or include or be open and, uh, and understand, understand it. Um, what do you feel? What is that new theater that you are noticing, what you're writing about? How is it dealing with these identity politics, which is a very big question here in the United States? I think, I mean, it's a big question here as well, but of course the discourse is uh, slightly different, I guess, and often it's also a problem that uh, discourse is maybe sometimes taking too much one-to-one -one from an Anglo-American uh, uh, context to, to, for example, a German context where, where certain situations are are different. But of course, it's an important question, and I uh, and and a lot of works deal with it and try to f figure things out. And it relates again to what we were talking before. Also, when you were talking, for example, about Polish, the questions like what can we represent on stage also? So who can represent whom? So this discussion- Who is allowed to represent whom? Who is allowed yeah. to represent yeah. whom? Who is not represented at all, etc. So this, of course, is a question, I mean, it's in the core of theater that, you know, like this yeah. is the, the uh, one to one, the questions that theater has to ask itself uh, at the same time. And post dramatic theater was discussing this for a long time uh, under, from, from a different angle, from a different philosophical or theoretical angle, maybe. But the question, who can play whom and what do you do when you represent, for example, certain, certain role models was in, in theater or, always an important question. And in the last 20, 30 years, it was um, uh, with post-traumatic theater discussed again in, in, from a different angle, I would say. So when Polish, for example, says, yeah, but if you play, if you repeat playing Ophelia over centuries, maybe this idea, this model of a woman only exists because of this continuous representation in theater. Even you might represent it in critical, with a critical, uh, attitude, but still you represent, you reproduce it every time. And that, of course, goes into uh, con and other questions of representation around identity politics, etc. So, so I think that's, it's, it's a very important question. And it's not, um, it's not a question where there will be an easy or fast answer uh, to it for theater, because in the end, you, you also have to, you know, like, the question of representation for theater means, so what, what, can you then represent as a performer, as an actor? I, can you represent at all somebody else? Can you, or, or, or can you basically only represent yourself on stage? Which is a discussion we had before, but now it gets politically more loaded, I think, in, in, recent, in recent years and especially again in, in recent months. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think you, you also very convincingly argue that it is time um, to uh, take the um, how uh, into a consideration. You said that often part also easy participation is a placebo. Uh, you make people believe they participate. Meanwhile, they really don't have anything to say how the play goes now. It's all pre-thought um, and um, that um, this is not uh, uh, really just about a, a, a formal um, inventions, but there has to be a change. You say, you know, going back to medieval times, you say it was clear the king was the king, that, and, but he also was a body, he was a representation of power. So, you know, he presented both, the king is dead, but long live the king, he would be the internal representation of an existing society. Then perhaps with Louis XIV and the French uh, 17th century, he said, he was king and the person and God almost in one way, but the idea of democracy is it is not represented by one person. It is not embodied. It is not a Trump-like figure. Actually, it's a diversity. It's a, a multi-directional, as you say, a, a representation. And you cannot represent it. It's impossible to represent, you know, that's, uh, but you cannot not represent also. Exactly. And in that, in that uh, 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 as you wrote, in that kind of, uh, electricity that between these things you know is a there there is a big chance and that as Brecht told us it's just a symbolic representation on stage we should not and no longer represent um, 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 you know ways of thinking that perhaps are not reflecting the very basic idea of democracy yeah, there's all this yeah Brecht in a way said it in his way there's always a gap you have always to see the gap between the representation and uh, what what is represented. And for me, I mean, not being a political theorist, it's really uh, quite astonishing how these questions of political theory uh, are mirrored in theater as questions about representation. And and I think the answer is, as you said, yeah, we we, we have we we cannot and we cannot not 
represent uh, and and uh, use representation is the same in politics and and this is a struggle also why i think that yeah there are no there isn't but we maybe are more aware now than than uh, um, than before or many of us are uh, is is the, that there's not a solution for it so it's always uh, this this question about representation will never be solved so uh, so so as other questions will never be solved. So when Derrida talks about uh, uh, the, the, the coming democracy, so democracy is always to come and never there. So, so, so there will never be the moment when it arrived in a way. And this goes, I think that there will never be one solution is, is also something that where, where theater is a perfect place, a perfect medium um, to, to, to deal with. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I write, for, for, for me, the, the concept of Chantal Mouffe of uh, agonistic pluralism is, is, is uh, for theater really very productive because- Can what, you go in she this? Is. She is perhaps not as well known. And this is, I think, a central argument and also something what you took for the theater. Can you talk about her idea and what it means for you that really is, it's central, I think, to your book? To, to simplify it a lot, uh, <laughs> she basically. We have time. We have some time. No, no, I, but it's also okay to simplify. I mean, you know, I'm not a theorist, so I can simplify. <laughs> I'm allowed to simplify. But what she basically says is that like, a lot of um, or she and Ernesto Laclau, uh, who developed this, this theory, that eventually a lot of also leftist theorists always believed that in the future there would be a moment where we could reach consensus. So in a way, Marx did with uh, communism that would maybe arrive one day. Even Habermas uh, and others, uh, uh, Rawls or whatever, have, they have in a way an idea that there could be a consensus. So if we evolve enough, if we learn enough, if we become better human beings, uh, better societies, we, we could we could agree. And what Muff basically says that that's that's nice. I mean, we all would love it, but it will never happen. It's, it's, it's just not in the human DNA, if you wish. First of all, we, it's not in the human DNA, but also there, there's not only one solution to things. It's, there, there will be several solutions. So what happens when we kind of push the idea that there should be a consensus on everything, um, like also in Germany for many years, uh, Angela Merkel was kind of representing this idea of uh, that uh, everything, that there's a common sense, there's no alternative the sentence that Maggie Thatcher already used is also a sentence that Angela Merkel likes. So, so if there's no, no alternative, you basically just push other ideas outside. So they don't go away, people that be don't believe in it. They may, might shut up, shut up, but they don't go away. So what democracy in the end needs to be is, is, is to provide a place where differences can be acted out, where, where, where also struggles can be acted out. That's, that's what democracy is. And what she basically says, she, she uses these two terms of, uh, uh, she uses the term of agonism, agonistic pluralism, which comes from, from the Greek agon, the, the competition of arguments in the Greek tragedy is called an agon. Huh? So, so it comes out so of a, theater vocabulary, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah, theater and sports vocabulary, which was close at that <laughs> time, in, in a way. And so, so, so we need to have a space where this competition of arguments can happen. If we don't have an agonistic space, we eventually will get an antagonistic space, a space where basically uh, these opinions are so far apart and so strongly divided that there's no way of even keeping them in one room, not, not agreeing that she doesn't want, but not even being able to, to have this exchange anymore. One could, of course, look at the US and Absolutely. think uh, that looks like maybe a little bit like what, what she meant. Uh, so she says, yeah, eventually their, their civil war is the only thing coming out of it. So democracy needs to provide an agonistic space and we need to accept that there are other opinions, which doesn't mean anything goes so there's also a negotiation of the limits of these other opinions but we if we only believe in the consensus uh, this will not work and theater i guess for me was always a medium where the conflicts are represented from the greek tragedy to shakespeare even in in psychological drama you could say the conflict is maybe within one person or within one body or one mind but still it's about it's about representing conflicts uh, or, or enabling conflicts in the theatrical space, so it's very much in the in the concept of theater, and and this is something where I think some examples showed it that in theater still it was possible, for example, to have an agonistic space where outside maybe it was already impossible. Um, 
Milo Rao did an interesting work several years ago, the Moscow trials, where he um, re, not reenacted, but he re, um, repeated in a way three important trials against art in Moscow. In the trials that should never happen. They should have happened, but they were sent to jail. He said, we need. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, they, they were, yeah. They, they, they were not. There was never a fair trial to to, yeah. to those. Yeah. So, 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 two were like censored exhibitions where artists went to prison, and the third one is the famous Pussy Riot uh, um, uh, uh, trial after their performance in the in the church. And and he kind of, on in three days, invited very different members of society uh, of the Russian society, really from. From far right wing TV moderators, Cossacks, uh, etc., uh, um, um, religious activists, Orthodox activists, to artists, uh, curators, um, human rights activists, and so on, uh, in in one space. And um, the the rules of the game were, were the ones of a of a trial. So there was a judge, there was lawyers, there was a, a attorney general, etc. There was a jury, and in three days, a discussion about Russia and the freedom of art uh, and religion was happening in Sakharov Center in Moscow, which outside of this space, I think at that time already wouldn't have been possible anymore in, in Moscow. So, so this was a, maybe a good example for where, where art really can provide a space to, to maybe have the utopia or the nostalgia of, of that it's still possible to at least have this opinion in one space. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it is uh, it is quite uh, quite a convincing uh, um, thought, idea, or contribution to what what we should be doing now, what we should be thinking about. That this idea of, in a way, of a competition, but a fair one, and that it does not just happen in sports. Even so, it comes out. I think of the Olympic uh, spirit. I think this Argon was a daemon or a spirit who manifested it during the Olympic Games. You know, he was the if I read right the brother of Nike, you know, the victory. So he was, um, it was essential and it was more important perhaps to lose in an agonistic conflict to a great opponent, you know, than uh, to cheat or to, uh, to um, as you said, you know, to demonize and not taking seriously arguments um, of the others. And I think the radicalization in the US where Republicans and Democrats are almost like the Yankees fan and Red Sox fan in baseball, you know, or Bayern Munich and Hertha. I don't know. So what would you say? People who do not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you want to win. You can use every dirty trick. You just have, this is not the idea. It's not uh, uh, something that is uh, convincing and that this uh, agonistic um, uh, idea that also, if I, I remember right from your book, the term of the antagonists in a play, you know, where you have the one this and then one wins, you know, like there's the battle with Achilles and Hector, one wins. And that this is not the idea, you know, that an agonistic is there is a, 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 a plurality of voices, perhaps with the knowing that it will never be over the fight, but for a moment, maybe someone has the better cards or the better arguments and also what is necessary. At the moment you write, uh, it is no longer important in theater to show what's wrong with the world. It is important to show what could work and what works. It's a radical think, difference. Uh, it's a radical yeah. difference. And I think this is really important politically, but also for art, uh, uh, as you say, I mean, I'm speaking mainly from a, from a Western European context. So, uh, so of course it's different in different contexts, but, but often I had the feeling like, I mean, yeah, as you described, there, there are different opinions, there are different positions in this, but it's a it's a fight. So it's not cozy. It's not saying let's stay in a room and everybody has right and whatever. It's it's about fighting, fighting to win, knowing that there will never be a you will never win, at least not forever, but you have to fight for your your uh, for your ideas. And very often it's a bit like uh, yes, we we you know. It's a bit within the bubble, so we know we are right, but uh, why don't we? So you, you, you are busy with criticizing the others uh, or, or showing what they do wrong, and sometimes forget maybe to to rather formulate what is our project in it. And Chandel Mouffe very much draws from 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 Gramsci, who who described this cultural hegemonies like that 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 it's a hegemonic, it's uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's about 
fighting for cultural hegemony and for this you need to want to win so you need to argue why why not only say the other is is wrong but what what is actually what you have to offer i mean and this we, we all have our own political examples i guess <laughs> for that and also in the in the us in the presidential presidential election so which, which were the candidates that offered something else or which are the ones are just saying like the others are bad uh, so, so so we need to we, we cannot just say we are on the right side we we, we need to to fight this fight uh, and that's what that means is in every every context very different so also that's maybe also important to say what works in berlin now probably doesn't work in new york and definitely probably doesn't work in in i don't know in 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 congo or in in in, uh, in argentina or whatever so so every every context needs different different tools or adjustments of the strategies there's not one possibility also not artistically where you can say like oh now we have a model of theater that's perfect that will work for the next 10 years in every city in the world it won't no it, it might not work next month anymore we something we just noticed <laughs> in our own lives uh, but, but and it also might already not work 100 kilometers from where we are so so it's also about specific what this this agonistic field can be or should be in in, in a specific context Mm -hmm. But um, you have created festivals, of course you go as a professional, so many, many others. Um, well, how is the audience reaction? Is, the, is it often is used the audience wasn't ready yet, you know, in avant-garde, which is also true. Um, the audience won't understand or, will be, or, or they like it. What, what is, how, how do you feel? Um, what, are, what are the, in Europe at least, what are the reactions of audiences to this different Really, just radically different approaches um, to to theater. I think it it is like it was in the last 20, 30 years with uh, with a lot of post dramatic theater that I often think it's less about. I mean, there are things that are complicated, and there are situations where an audience also has to work for something, which is totally fine. But I think very often it's the bigger problem is. Um, it's not that it's complicated, but that you have a wrong perception of what you will enter in. So if you enter play and wait for the king and no king comes, you will be disappointed. So no way you can get, if you come and, and just see, and that's maybe the, uh, also in terms of the analogy of the, of the games, uh, if, you, if you come and see, okay, what are the rules of this game? Where, are I? Where am I? What are the rules that are proposed? Uh, how they are, are they played? And uh, are they played well? I mean, you can also dis or dis do I agree with the rules? I don't have to agree with them. But to understand what are the rules of the specific game that is proposed is, I think, a good good way to enter uh, art or, or theater, maybe especially. And and then you can still say, okay, that's not my game, or I think it's stupid, or I hate it, or whatever, or it's very badly played, which happens. <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, but you, ha I guess, with a lot of work, if there's an openness towards it, it's not that complicated, usually, mm -hmm. you know, like also the example I, I, as I brought, you know, when you're in there, it's not complicated to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. You might not want it, which is also fine, but it's not complicated. So it's important to, to, to shape the expectation that it's very clear you're not going to see, you know, you're not going to see a rock concert and although it's a classical Schaber ensemble or the other way around, you know, so you um, know what you come in and Lehmann always says, and I have, we have said it many times, theater is a house and it has many, many rooms. I think definitely this is the new addition in a way to the participatory one. Uh, also the idea of the documentary in a way, also what Milo Rao did in a way, you know, it's kind of a documentary theater of the real with a twist, what Carol Martin um, um, talks about. And, um, and I think uh, there is something to that idea of the game or Agon, uh, if I understand right, also means assembly. It has the idea of competition, a little bit of a game-like competition, but still, you know, you, you, you prove your forces, your arguments, but it's also assembly. It also means, as you said in the very beginning of the road, coming together, which is part of theater, you know, it's just the fact that you say, meet up as friends, and we go there, then you talk about what you what you saw, and then you have dinner, and uh, you understand a little bit more, perhaps, about the life, or you liked it, or you didn't like it, like a game you go, like a soccer game or football game, you might not like all the games, they're not all great games, but you still watch it. And um, so your idea, I would like to hear more, and maybe also it's something to, 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 to uh, look further on in your writing, I think the idea of game 
um, uh, that you look at theater as a, as a, if I understand right, as a game. So you talk about rules of the games and understanding. So tell a bit more what you, uh, what you feel uh, could be different if it made clear that it's a, a game. Do you, do you think there are played games, what we see on stage? No, I, I no. It's I think more the game is the, the the situation we enter, not not on stage, but the whole situation, the coming together, the the temporary community we are. What are the rules of this game where we enter as an audience, even when the lights go out and we have to shut up and watch the stage? So what 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 is, uh, yeah, what what rules are proposed, and if it's, and and how do they? What possibilities do they offer? I mean, Nora Sternfeld, the Austrian curator, she, she likes to say like, but the, the, it becomes interesting when it's not only played with the ru rules, but it's uh, but the, the rules themselves are at stake. You, you can you can you can play with the rules or maybe also so which is a daring uh, concept for theater i don't know you know like do we yeah. want for example how much freedom do we want when we, when we propose a democratic space is it democratic enough that uh, the evening could go completely somewhere else or do we say which i don't say i'm not saying that's necessarily good it, it's something we need to also negotiate so what 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 are the rules we create for the evening and and what and and what is the the what is the audience or the participants or the guests or whatever they might be what are they invited to to participate in and it relates to to uh, when you when you mentioned uh, Hansis Lehmann uh, with the post traumatic theater which he of course already often mentioned we cannot forget the real situation we are in so there might be a fictional situation or they, i guess there to a degree there always isn't theater even in the if it's sometimes a very thin or very uh, fragile uh, fiction uh, but we can never forget the real situation we are also in. We are so for a certain time together with other human be beings. We are we are supposed to behave in a certain way, uh, and this needs to be part of when we are invited to play, uh, to play along in a way or to take part in it. Okay. Which which doesn't mean that I think that it's always necessary that everybody is allowed to do everything. It's it's about negotiating the, these roles. It's totally can be totally fine to shut up and sit sit in your seats and watch something on stage. Uh, if that if that makes sense in the context of the proposed game, mm -hmm. no, it's a, it's a, I think it's truly something to to think about and give a definition of it that in a competitive uh, representation of ideas on stage. I think Michael Frayn, the uh, British great British playwright, once was at the Seagull set on. He said in a great play, everybody is right. You know, as everybody says, you know, and you don't. We can, others, I say, every, people have their own opinion. And then the audience member also, you know, makes up their minds and, uh, and change the idea of uh, that it is actually clear to everybody it's a game, but you are part of it. And there are rules of the game, but they're also visible, if I understand right, or they are on the line, as you say, they are at stake. And this is something truly new. And I feel with this theater of a Rimini Protocol or Susanna Kennedy, uh, uh, um, or uh, the, the Latour, uh, Frédéric uh, Aitui and uh, works, what they do, Philippe Quesney, it, they, you, you feel the rule, they are putting the rules out there. So what's going on? It's an uncertainty or uneasiness also, as you uh, uh, talk about. Um, I think Fassbinder, at the end of his work, he didn't want to be called director anymore. He said Spielleiter, like it which was, is an old word in German, you know, the di direct, like, like, like a leader of a game. And, and that is maybe um, um, uh, something of, a, of um, to think about, that, that it could be the artists or leaders of games in a society that needs games. And they are not just commercial Yankees, football, Bayern Munich, winning one, two with sponsors, you know, games that also compete, their ideas out there. And, audiences are asked to make up their minds. It's something radically different and better. There's an, an example of work that I quite like. I mean, it's very specific and I don't say all theaters should be like this, but the, as, a, as, an, as a setup to really figure, figure this out, I found, found it really challenging and inspiring. It's by a, um, a Dutch uh, theater maker, Lotte Vandenberg, and she had this project called Building Conversation. And what she basically did over the last years is um, she said, okay, for her, if you 
I mean, in her definition, if you would strip everything away from theater, that is not essential. It's nice to have or great or whatever, but it's not essential. At the end, there would be a conversation between people following certain rules. So that's basically her uh, definition in a nutshell. And she said like, okay, let's, let's try this. And what she did, she took uh, conversations from uh, different conversation models from, from different parts of the world and different concepts behind it. Like the Jesuits have a certain way of conversing uh, when they debate something there. She took uh, a model from Niels Bohr, the quantum physicist, quantum physicist who uh, wanted to, to, to develop a model for creative, uh, collective uh, creative intelligence and so on. So she took very different models and, and, and took more and more in. And what you would do basically, you would arrive in the evening, you buy for one of these, these shows or whatever it is, uh, you buy a ticket. So you buy, for example, a conversation without words. Uh, and then you go there, you have your ticket, and then you're brought to a certain place, you're, I don't know, 15 people or something, 15, 20 people, uh, and somebody might, depending on what conversation you have, somebody might moderate it, maybe not, you, you explain the rules of this conversation, and then you're left alone, there's no performer, there's just the audience which then becomes the performer. So basically, and sometimes you discuss what topic you want to discuss, sometimes there is a topic, sometimes there's maybe a time frame, uh, sometimes maybe you in the beginning discuss how long it should last, and then you're there. So then you're supposed to have a conversation. And, uh, and uh, it's quite an interesting situation because you think like, First of all, you'd think also about your own responsibility. Maybe you think it's stupid. I really didn't pay for this. I don't like it. So maybe I want to leave. But there are only 15 people in the room. Uh, so it's like, if I leave, you know, it's maybe not fair. Should I stay or let's, let's wait for a moment? Then who starts a conversation? Who says something? You might not want, but then you feel like, ah, but I'm, uh, maybe I'm also responsible for this evening to function. So there's a, there's a negotiation also about the responsibility of it. And then you have this double moment which I mentioned before that you really have a situation where you're inside and outside of a situation so so because it's called called theater and you bought this ticket you probably also will think like oh how does it work why are certain people speaking more than others why do I speak this way why, why, how do people argue or whatever you kind of like are part of of the performance but you at the same time you, you look at it and try to understand it. And this is, a, I think, a, as, a, as an experiment or as a model, a really a, a, a very interesting work. And actually, because you asked like, how does audience react to the ones I saw, some people were in there that really thought, I think in the beginning, they would buy a ticket for a real, real show. And, but they were actually, the ones that went into it often were the most enthusiastic afterwards because they had a completely different experience and also a way of feeling of being part of it than others. Others of course thought that's bullshit and um, maybe try to get out or, or stay there but uh, but you're trapped in this you cannot easily get out which <laughs> it's not always a nice situation that theater yeah. needs to produce but I find it really an, a very productive example. A brilliant, a brilliant ensemble and I think I don't know if you mentioned in your book or the silent conversation is an Inuit right? uh, uh, tradition um, um, so um, there are very different ways, you know, um, I mean, there is in, the, in America also audience feedback rules, you know, developed, you know, by um, dancers who felt it was so wrong how audience often makes. So there are rules of conversations. And as you say, the shakers or the others, my, everybody has different ones. Interesting to pull it out. And it's a democratic art in that sense. It is something where the audience members are in charge in a way. They are the director, they are the writer, they are uh, participating in it. And this is what of significance and what we have lost is the idea that democracy is a participatory, in one could say in your idea, game, a participatory uh, uh, um, enterprise and that theater has to also try to get back to that truth and maybe that's the most important, get engaged, do something and, uh, and where the activism um, then uh, later also uh, comes in. And I think this is um, uh, uh, something we have a responsibility perhaps, you know, to get people out of the idea to be a consumer. We say, it's, well, all this, yeah. what did he, like in a supermarket, you have 20 felt pens, which one should I take? Which play do I go to? Which candidate do I, well, what did he or she say yesterday? What, no, so be par participate in democracy, take time. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 I totally agree. But also it's it, and at the same time, 
it's of course like in this work, but also in democracy, not complete freedom. So there are rules. So there are rules yep. proposed, yep. and you can you can I mean you can decide not to obey them, but maybe the others want to obey them. Then you have to negotiate why you would change the rules. But the rules are very tangible, and I think maybe that's one of the most important things. It's not it's not that everything should be possible or everybody needs to have all rights in a performance all the time. It's mm -hmm. about uh, being able to 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 understand the rules and to accept them and deal with them so so yeah, it's, it's not absolutely. about it's not about manipulation i think i'm not a big fan of manipulation in theater so it's a uh, because i think it's a uh, it's obscuring it's obscuring the rules and it's uh, at least in in political theater i'm not a fan of manipulation let's say which i might enjoy when i watch a hollywood movie uh, i'm i don't enjoy it if it's about if it's supposed to be a political situation that is created, that that there's that's a contradiction for me that is, uh, yeah, mm. that is often not very clearly understood. Yeah, yeah it's true. I think even when these uh, first Europeans arrived on the Mayflower uh, on that ship, they had a little uh, moment of uh, revolt and didn't know what to do. And before they left the ship, they agreed to rules in that new world, you know, and some say that was actually the predecessor to the American Constitution, very interesting ones, you know, also to listen to respect because now they went to a territory that perhaps was no longer uh, protected because they landed much more east, they wanted to be at the Hudson, but they landed in Plymouth, they were no longer English also territory, it was not, you know, uh, granted as a right, and they had to come up with something, and I think this idea of uh, responsible participatory uh, communication and that theater and performance is a space for this is something um, significant. And one could argue that great directors like the Peter Steins of the Patrice Chirots, uh, um, um, the Jerome Robbins, maybe still, they were like the prince, you know, they were the Louis XIV who when they were directing, they had the seat where normally the prince would watch and see everything perfect. They are now, you know, and they're the geniuses and, they're, and they have ant antagonistic conflicts on stage where something wins at the end or even if it loses something. And um, so you really do still represent models. You know, they are no longer contemporary in that big idea of democracy where uh, it is hard to, to do. It has to be renegotiated, reinvented as theater does. Um, but it has to be participatory. And I think this is a fantastic uh, 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 new, perhaps also a way to look at it, the way you apply uh, uh, Chantal Mouffe's uh, ideas. Um, do you, do you please yourself create work? Do you, put, have you done uh, games? You created games or do you see your, your festival? Is that a big game? Well, uh... I mean, as a curator, I created situations together with artists uh, where I think certain uh, rules apply, for example. But uh, uh, but uh, I think in normal festivals, they are a bit less. I mean, there are rules, as we know, you have to come at time and you buy your ticket and so on. But these are the boring rules. But to, to play with this game is um, sometimes it's possible, I guess, also in a curatorial concept. So the, the one project you mentioned, Truth is Concrete, that we did together with the curatorial team at, uh, at uh, Steirischer Herbst uh, eight years ago but now, pretty much exactly now, eight years ago, um, which was a, um, a big gathering of really hundreds of people from all over the world, uh, artists, activists, theorists, on the question, on the relationship between art and politics at that time. It was, it was the time when the, all the square movements had started. Uh, actually, when we started conceiving this project, it was, um, it was still before Occupy Wall Street would happen. When we finally did it, Occupy Wall Street was already over, as uh, at least at the at Sakoti Park. So, so, uh, so this time, of course, uh, changed quite fast. But the idea was bring, to bring everything together in a certain in a certain context and with certain rules. So we we wanted to do a uh, to 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 capture also this moment of intensity. So it was really a marathon of 100, 170 hours where there was always program. So there was no break. One thing stopped and the other was happening. So it was also during night and so so and it mm -hmm. had a very rigid. It had, like the, the 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 rules were also that it was very rigid. If something was supposed to stop at one o'clock, it stopped at one o'clock, and then the next thing would happen. So there was not much freedom in it. And parallelly to there was a space with completely different rules where we tried and where it was possible to continue things for hours to to that things that we didn't curate or organize where people could just could take the space like a so it was like a both like a 
vertical machine running and a horizontal uh, um, very open space and 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 two different ways of negotiating rules uh, for example so 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 this would be an example where i think also in a curatorial concept um, the idea of rules came in and also uh, obviously not necessarily nice rules. So it was also about making the rules, for example, we as curators that uh, are an artistic organization like Steirische Erbs, that there's of course also hierarchies involved. So we didn't try to hide them in a way, we kind of like a, rather try to make them very visible and discussable in a way. Yeah. Um... So, yeah. So, so I think that would be one. So, so of course, also in curatorial concept, there can be uh, um, can be rules and games dealing with time and space and how you organize people and so on and that can be developed together with artists. So, so there's also space in the curatorial that goes in the same direction. I, I think curatorial concepts also can can or should uh, to a degree provide agonistic uh, spheres and agonistic uh, spaces. So, so I wouldn't. Um, so I wouldn't confuse the role of a curator or a programmer with the one of an artist, but I would say uh, they, are, um, they can touch or overlap at moments uh, or co-create co something together in certain, in certain situations. Yeah, but in the idea of a Joseph Beuys and this enlarged idea you know, of an artist, I think certainly, I think in my view is, is, is an artistic, you know, uttering, you know, your festival, your ideas, what you, um, what you put out. One question I had, I didn't see that this Théâtre de Nougat Négociation from uh, Latour and uh, Frédéric Atuitui. Did, did you see it? No, I also, this I also didn't see, no. Um, it's an interesting project. And my, and my <laughs> French, unfortunately, is very bad, so. so yeah. <laughs> what did you hear? What did you hear about it? And tell us. Well, I, wait, I, I was talking also with, the, with them about it, and, uh, and, and so I heard a lot of and saw, saw material of it, but I think that the general idea, of course, was um, well, they created to say that this was created as an as an alternative model to the climate uh, conference uh, the, of the UN that was happening in Paris at that mm -hmm. time. So it was not supposed to 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 explain it or to to represent it to a degree as Rimini Protocol did on the same climate uh, conference, uh, but rather to to create a utopian version of it. And of course, it was based also on, on Latour's idea uh, of a parliament of things that other entities than humans should be should have a voice in there. But how do you represent a river in a, in a, in a legal or in a parliamentary conversation? How do you represent an animal or a, a whole landscape uh, uh, or an they environment. No they have no yeah. So, I, so it was more. It was basically. I, it, it was less about the theatrical setup than about taking different models of talking to each other. Maybe in, in a way a little bit like Lotte Pannenberg uh, to to find different ways of of really representing interest, trying to represent very different interests also of entities that could not represent their interests for themselves in, in there. Uh, and uh, so it was inviting experts and, uh, and um, a lot of students and activists from, from, uh, from different parts of the world to, to create a charter. So it also had a goal. It was really about putting something out at the end, uh, a, a different kind of charter uh, for, uh, uh, against the climate catastrophe. Or to prevent the climate catastrophe, uh, so so it was uh, really very much about creating, uh, yeah, a, a, uto a utopian version maybe, or at least a optimistic version of of how this conversation should uh, should function. Yeah, yeah, and I think also their their idea of the kind of the non-human actor that normally even on stages they use it as a political idea, but also use the metaphor of theater or performance that they are non-human actors like the virus right now or plants, animals, the critical sphere like 15 meters above the earth and below the earth that allows life. We have to think of it and think that humans are no longer at the center, like that king-like idea that we also have that we think we are. Louis XIV, we are the king of the world because we are humans, you know, especially white or white males like we are, you know, so that no, this is decentralized, you know, there's a variety of forces around us and we have to be aware if we want to survive, if we want to leave the world as a better place or with the chance to become a better place, things really have to, to, to um, 
change. I, I also liked, I think you, you quoted Tanya Bruguera, who also was here on the program, not in this book, but in some other work you said, where she said, uh, um, the French Revolution was a great gesture of democratizing the arts and life. And we haven't had anything this significant um, since. She says, why do we still go to the palaces? Why do we go, you know, uh, to the Louvre, where you also, you know, you kind of adore this? The relics uh, of these time <clears throat> how we go to palaces she says no we should go to the houses of people we should go inside the lives of people you know how how and represent that in a way that is uh, uh reflecting also our society and in also like in uh, whatever the documentary theater or theater of the real often these are the quiet stories you know they are not the spectacular reality tv shows with you know extremes that you know the the quietness uh, or that quiet theater movement of japan in a way that even though it's written but comes out of that in the everyday is something very powerful and significant in the life of the people and not the exceptional one, but the everyday, the normal ones and what we experience. And, um, and I think um, all these uh, points we talked about together are truly a, a point to a new engagement or to a, um, a different engagement. You wrote about the nature theater of Oklahoma to, to change a little bit as the Monty Python said to something completely different, but still it's connected. Where do they fit in, in this idea of, of yours? But on one hand, they fit. Um, yeah, just to say, so maybe say a few words about them so people might not know who they are. Well, yeah, well, I, yeah. Nature Theatre of Oklahoma is, I think, one of the most interesting theatre companies for me since a couple of years. And they, uh, I would say, they a New York-based company that very much challenged, I think, a lot of aesthetic con uh, conventions in, in their work. Um, and even so, I would say, uh, the audience usually sits in the room and shuts up in their work. I think the way how they are challenged by the, by the work, by the, by the uh, uh, on, on stage creates quite an quite an active uh, uh, participation at, uh, at least with the ones that are interested in it. So I think uh, in terms of seeing the, the theater as a, itself, the theater space as a site specific space and, and working with that, uh, they're a very good example. I don't have them in the book because I also don't, I don't uh, in a way I'm also fighting in terms of, uh, what I'm fighting, but I'm, I, I, I um, uh, I, I think it would be helpful to to uh, to aim for a strong notion of the political when we talk about political art. So there has been the tendency of saying, well, everything is political and uh, all theater is political and so on. I understand the arguments. I just don't think, uh, think they are very productive. So for me, it's bad. So, so in this book, I really focus on works that also explicitly, also in their contact, content, uh, uh, want to be uh, political and and uh, deal with political issues, while uh, Nature Theatre of Oklahoma, in, in many ways, takes takes a more poetic uh, approach to that, and also I think creates political situation and also raises political questions in that. But that's not their let's say not their main goal. So so I rather would separate these spheres a little bit. Um, for, uh, yeah, it's a bit forced to separate them, but for the for understanding uh, what what is happening, it, it was helpful for me. So actually, they they are not even mentioned <laughs> in the book of political theater, even though they are a very important uh, company for for, uh, for me. But they are they are, you say that they are their formal idea of theater and the participatory offsite uh, aspect of their work. You know, the Nibelung and the others, you know, it's, 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 it's clearly uh, another one. I say it's important, I think, to also give a shout out to them because it's so hard for them to get produced in New York. Nobody really does it. They're, they're like dogs, of the highway, you know, they're in the way and it's complicated. Meanwhile, um, there is theater like this that we, that has what uh, um, I think also Claire Bishop talks about, and you mentioned it, the situationalists, they say they, is this, they create a situation that points beyond what you just see points to the larger picture. And so your book, I think, does that. It points, um, that's why I like it, to a larger um, a larger themes we all are wrestling with, especially also in America, where we have to think what are forms we use. And I always like to quote Man Ray, uh, the great American artist. I have seen an exhibition of his early work 
and there were paintings. There were landscape paintings. He grew up in Richwood, I think, in New Jersey, and they are uh, sublime, I would say. I was so surprised. I couldn't believe my eyes. They were beautiful uh, work of an artist, but Man Ray said, I cannot be an artist who paints landscapes. It's not of our time. It is not the message we have to go. It is not contemporary. It is wrong, as Joseph Boyce said, you know, you want to be an artist and you go in an art store and you buy a canvas and a frame. Maybe that's already the first mistake, you know? And so the question really is, it's not, can you do that? Of course, people can write plays or direct and they can direct like a Peter Stein, but perhaps work together ensembles, as you also point out, two teams of duos, trios of directors, companies that are no longer from one country. They are, you know, international. It's hard to say, are they French or German or often people are chosen by nationality that, uh, that also um, has changed and, uh, and should change. So um, I think it is of, uh, uh, of importance to say this is also next to doing theory. You have to also choose what form, what you said earlier, you know, uh, how do you do that? Is also significant next to of course, what it is about. So how you choose the form you represent something that is already of significance before you have the first day of rehearsal. And I think we need to be aware of that. And I think your, 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 your book uh, points out towards that. We're coming closer to the end. So a question would be the time of Corona, perhaps also the Black Lives Matter movement, but especially also time of Corona. You, you quote Heiner Müller in it with a quote I think that also fits. He, Heiner Müller said, what makes theater special is not that you have a live audience, that you have that it happens live. He said what actually is of significance that potentially the audience member could die or can die, you know, um, that um, or potentially dying, you know, this is one of the last things he, she sees in her life. And now we have Corona, which is, you know, an appropriate quote. So, um, so uh, in your thinking, in your research, and I'm sure you did a lot of reading in this time. Uh, so is something changing in your mind uh, or in things you read? Do you detect something I think it's a bit too early to say. So when we talk about theater, I think for me it's rather like that it may, maybe brings out more clearly what theater can and what it can't do. So I think in the end, theater is a medium. I mean, not very original, but it is a medium that needs a life a life encounter of people that needs people coming together. Uh, if it if it becomes digital or, uh, or uh, streamed online, etc., it changes. It becomes another art form. Might be just as great or whatever, but but it, it loses this. So I think that this the the scale of theater is, is human is human size, even though we might want to bring in other entities, as we said. But I think it's a it's a it's it's it, it's it's uh, it's limited in the scale, it's limited in the possibilities. It can negotiate society in, in this scale. That became for me with a lot of experiments even more clear. And and I think there's it so also what what is the political potential of it became uh, more clear in it. So that's uh, so in, in a way I would say for me my view on theater or the possibilities of theater didn't change but maybe became more even more more clear in that um, and well stepping a bit out of theater I think what what is maybe you know like in the beginning of uh, the lockdowns there was a lot of talk that like capitalism comes to an end now and so on I mean this um, unfortunately was probably not very realistic at any moment but what it maybe did is also and which is also important for the theater it opened some moments of um, of showing that things could be different so there is an alternative suddenly when health system gets nationalized in some countries suddenly where everybody says it's impossible or suddenly it's it's possible from one day to the other uh, when certain subsidies are suddenly even in new york i just had a talk with a friend from new york said like for the first time in their lives they got uh, they got subsidies and money money from from the government uh, to support their so so suddenly I mean, these are pragmatic examples, but I think also in terms of uh, communalizing uh, uh, certain structures and things and, uh, and uh, infrastructures, uh, we, we saw 
that maybe something else is possible. Uh, and, and, and this, I think we should, we should probably keep and, and, and try to, to make, um, uh, to use theater also to, to let this not go and let this moment not go of saying, no, but we just saw that things could be different. Actually, it's possible even so. So, so you know, it was interesting to see that even some, I would say in Germany, even some liberal, neoliberal politicians seem to be quite happy that for a moment, um, political uh, the politics seemed to be a player uh, to, towards all these big companies and the market and so on again, where they usually are told you don't have anything to say anyway, it's regulated by the market and by the big corporations and companies. Suddenly there was a moment, no, actually there can be something else. And this we should uh, probably try not to let go also in, in, in when you think about theater. Yeah, yeah. So for a moment at least, uh lives matter and we say we want to shut down all businesses and bars and uh, and uh, offices in New York City <clears throat> so we save lives of people some el especially elderly people I think it is it quite something it's that matters that it does matter and this is what um, also was with a black lives matter that one life lost it did matter it did matter and it created something and I think this is hopeful and uh, it is important and um, yeah, so really, really um, thank you. And I think there are, uh, it's an ongoing contest what is discussed in theater, but theater itself also, you know, is part of that, that uh, uh, competition, what it is about. Peter Sondi, the great uh, German, uh, also no German, German writer who said, you know, about in his theory of theater, it's like a Prometheus, it's for a while it's chained on the rocks, you know, and uh, and it's a slave to uh, politics uh, or uh, you know, social socialist realism, or it's a slave to capitalism, or a slave to you know uh, to the kings and queens, and it it, it, it yearns to be liberated. In this, that you know, um, eagle come and eats his liver, but he ultimately will be in a new form, and there will be a reincarnation. Till again, he will be uh, suffering. But I think this is a moment. Perhaps there is a liberation um, of this Promethean idea of that promise. Um, of theater that as a representative, imaginary, symbolic uh, way, you know, shows what is great about mankind. And, uh, and I think uh, what you all wrote about, you know, the new forms of uh, coexisting, um, what do we really want? What world do we want in the theater? And how can theater be part of the reflection of a world we, we, we want to see? And without preaching, you said, without lecturing, and uh, how can we find self answers where are confident that yes, you know, something, something can be different about the big questions, you know, what forms um, do we need and what actions politically um, 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 can we take without having just an attitude, without just pretending to participate. And I think uh, this is a really, really important also for every artist and audience members uh, to participate. And so thank you really for, for taking the time. And uh, I know it's not enough to go in all of it, what you talked about, the immersions or activism, the non-human, <clears throat> or as you also call the post-human theater, what we see, but um, uh, at least gives us an idea um, for the idea. And um, thanks for, for HowlRound to, um, to have us again, I think this is a, a great forum and I hope people were listening in today um, to talk about this. Tomorrow we again have Milo Rao with us, the one you, Florian, talked about. Katja de Geest and Carmen Hornbostel and Milo put together a book on what theater, why theater, why is it important now? They talked also, asked for, for written answers and they will come. And uh, I think he's just a day before opening the Berlin Schauspiele, Berlin, uh, the Berlin Schaubühne again. So it's a big honor, we feel that he took time out and then he goes back to Congo for one of her Congo trials about the Swiss, uh, uh, um, I think a steel uh, or mining company where he feels that is create, creating such a uh, great, um, inhuman and unjust uh, um, actions there and, and he they got in his symbolic trial of course um, uh, uh, accused for good reasons and uh, and so Emilio will be with us and also I think build on on what you say and I think this is also something if you have time to listen in tomorrow as for today this is an important will be an important Th thoughts to 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 listen to so thank you all for being with us today and again florian thank you for for doing this for writing that book for letting us participate in your research and your thoughts of what you have done like a painter who paints for six months or a year <clears throat> and then you see the pictures you wrote something 
<clears throat> put it down and now we can um, participate in your journey. So in this an artistic practice, and I think this is what we can learn for artists in our lives. We have to art, act like them and listen to them and, and um, also uh, um, follow the, their rules, uh, which might not be rules on the course, but great conversation. Really, really thank you. And uh, to all listeners, thanks for taking the time to listen in as it was about a book today. Uh, perhaps a bit uh, more complex, but I think it's really significant uh, what Florian uh, talks about and, uh, and any festivals around, you know, I'm sure he has an email, he's approachable, uh, you know, to curate, to do things. And, um, and I hope to also maybe join us in New York. We are trying to create a festival in the summer of 2022, also to really do it in all five boroughs with all the CUNY theaters, with New York organizations, but all the work that's happening already in the park is in the very beginning. But I think what you do there uh, is at the very center what we also might like to do. And uh, so maybe you can, can join us and help us and advise us and connect us. So um, this is a great contribution. Thank you. And um, I hope you will be able, all of you, to listen in tomorrow. And, um, and I hope that for also the all, people who listen, that there's something in there that touched them, that resonated um, for their own lives or for their own communities, how to reach out, how to create these assemblies, these discussions, and this is really transferable to, to the world we live in. And that's why, uh, additionally, this is uh, so important, um, Florian, what, what you have to say. So stay safe, stay tuned, and goodbye.